Now we're going to have a little open meditation, and I just invite you to relax. Look at And let's put our, as, as, uh, as David Dewhurst says, put phasers on stun. Put our phones on silent or vibrate. We don't want you to miss an important call. Oh, yeah. And just relax it too. The now in here, it's Sunday. And I don't know what everyone's work week looks like. Many work Monday, Friday, or Monday, Saturday. So for, we'll say maybe for most people, today is a free day. And you chose to make use of it in a very good way for you. Whether it was in this room, some other center of faith, understanding, you chose to take some time to think about God, to think about good. To think about and feel something beyond the ordinary dimensions of everyday living. And all of those things that you have set aside to carve out this time for yourself will still be there when you return from this time. But you will see them with more clarity. And deal with them with more inner peace. Because of what you have done for yourself. Acquaint now thyself with this power. In this hour together, something powerful and transformative is occurring in and to and through each one of us, assisted along by music and words and hugs and smiles and the energy of the group. So I invite you to be with your thoughts, your feelings, your sweet inner process, whatever that may be. It's absolutely glorious Sunday morning as we rest together for a few moments.
seeing my idea become a fact of my experience, I enjoy the happiness and peace of my thought fulfilled and gratefully speak these words, I accept. I accept. Knowing that I have an everlasting place in the midst of the power that sustains all creation, as well as the support of all those around me, I allow myself to relax in the peace of fulfillment and gratitude and say, I release. I release. Now in my mind's eye, I call to mind the face, the image of someone who's touched my life in powerful, wonderful ways. This could be a friend, a family member, a teacher of mine, and someone who's not physically present with me in this room this morning. So I greet this being of light and consciousness, turning toward that face I see in my mind's eye and say, I'm grateful for the good in your life. Now I open my eyes to the world around me, turn joyfully to these folks here and say to each of them, I'm grateful for the good in your life. All right. Well, I have a lot to tell you today. First of all, it's Super Bowl Sunday, which in Houston, Texas means very little this year. Uh, Mar Mardi Gras season begins the day after the Texans exit the playoffs. But we had, in one of the classes the other day, one of the students was saying just that, and he said, you know, it might as well be, oh, I don't know, the, the koalas versus the bunnies. Yeah. <laughs> and he said the koalas would win because the bunnies would keep jumping off sides. <laughs> Anyway, I just had to share this with you. I thought it was hilarious. Okay, straight up. Um, <laughs> today is more on the basics of the science of mind teaching, having to do this month with relationships. It being Valentine's month and Mardi Gras month and Super Bowl month and so forth. So here's what I want to tell you. There's a, there's a passage. Let's start with this. There's a passage by the poet Rumi. Do you know Rumi, the yeah. great Sufi poet? Mm -hmm. We quote him heavily in these rooms. Yes. Uh, <laughs> he, he said, step out of the circle of time and into the circle of love. And, and you can make of that what you will. Here's what I make of it. The circle of time is, well, it's, it's repetitive and it's conditional. It's, it's causal and it's effectual, you know? Everything is based on something prior that's based on something prior, and round and round you go. You just step out of that and into the circle of love, which is immediate, which is unconditional. The nature of unconditional means not conditioned by. And the only thing that can love unconditionally is an infinite something. You and I can try at the finite level to, uncon to unconditionally love, and the best that we can do is love a lot. And that's great. But it's really not unconditional. Now people will argue this point sometimes. They'll say, well, like a mother's love for her child is unconditional. And I would counter, no, it isn't. It's great love. There's probably no greater human love. But it's not unconditional because the condition is that's her child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not somebody else's child. If it were somebody else's child and she was a nice lady, she'd, be, she'd love that child too. But she's not going to love it like her own. That's the condition. Or you say, no, great. I'm in the greatest romantic relationship the world has ever seen. I mean, we're talking the stuff of grand opera here, okay? And nobody could, I love this person unconditionally. And what you mean by that is even if they took your heart out of your chest and stomped on it, you'd still love <laughs> There's really nothing you can think of that they could do. It might throw you, you might have to go into therapy over it, but you, you <laughs> Ultimately, it snapped back into the place of loving them. Well, that's great love, and it's, it might border on we need to talk kind of love. It's, it's, it's great love, but it's not unconditional because the condition is that they are your sweetie. Or you love, your, your dog loves you. And there we go, and we say, oh, that's absolutely unconditional love. Well, your dog loves you because you're you. That's the condition. And I'm not going to say it's because you feed them and all this, because there was an interesting article here recently about how cats don't, if you give a cat, it boiled down, lots of 
research boiled down to this. If you give the cat a choice between food and you, it'll take you. In other words, human companionship over the cat owner. Um, which surprised a lot of people who were not cat people. But the cats are actually drawn to human contact. But that's the condition, is that you are their human. You are, and you're also the alpha of their pack, kind of. That's how it works. Well, you and I are at the level of relationships, at the level of interaction. You and I are finite systems, if you will not be offended by my calling us that. You're a system. We're finite systems. That is to say, we have personalities. We create conditions, we create boundaries, we, we create contracts, social contracts with each other. And they're beautiful and they're wonderful. But there is something that does love unconditionally, and that's God. And I'm gonna call it God, I'm gonna use the G word and call it God rather than open ground of all being or some other euphemism, because God is not a God is not a dirty word. There may be some awful associations made with it. That you've been attacked with. But the concept itself, it's a good old Anglo-Saxon word and it means in any language. It, it comes down to the same thing, that there's an overarching creative power. And in this teaching, we believe it's infinite. We don't believe it's an old white guy who sits in the sky and looks mm -hmm. down and judges and, and weeps and condemns and throws himself around the room having all sorts of emotions about how we're not living up to divine expectations. No, we believe in this teaching that the essence of all creation is God. You have God in you. For that matter, the piano has God in it. The God in you manifests as self-conscious awareness in the piano and the chair and the tree and the cloud. It has other forms of awareness. And your form of awareness in you is what you're here to manage. That's how we live, is we learn to manage consciousness and make our way through this world. Well, God is sourcing you while you do that, and it's loving you unconditionally. And why it's loving you unconditionally, how it's able to do that, is because it's an infinite system. There's nothing beside it. And if its nature is love, it can't not love. This is a, a misunderstanding that needs to be cleared up sometimes, that when we say in this teaching that God doesn't judge you, and God loves you, and God does this and that and the other thing, we're not talking about because it's such a nice God that it does this, that it overlooks all of your, like the, the awful old song, though, it makes it sad to see the way we live, you know? It always says, I forgive. No, it doesn't make it sad to see God sad to see the way we live. It exuberates in how we live. And if we live harmfully to ourselves or another, you know what happens then? Consequences. And if we live graciously to ourselves or another, you know what happens then? Consequences. <laughs> some look like rewards, some look like punishments, but it just loves exuberantly out of its own self via us. Via us. There's an organization in New York City that helps the homebound, like Meals on Wheels. It's called God's Love We Deliver. Is that great? There's a motto for you, God's love. You deliver. I deliver. This person needs a friend. I show up as their angel. This person needs good counsel. God through me tells me what to say. This is how it works. Somebody's getting a call right now from someone. <laughs> so I need a friend. You'll answer the call. I hope you step out of the room if you do, but you'll answer the call and, and, and it'll be God's voice speaking through you. I know that sounds a little creepy sometimes, but that's all it's ever been. Is God showing up as us, as absolute unconditional love. So when Rumi says step out of the circle of time and into the circle of love, he means into the understanding of that infinite love that's passing through you in a finite sort of way and do what you can with it. Do the best you can with it. Do the best you can. Some years ago, we had a singer on this stage, one of a stream of young women from Austin who, well, they went ahead and got famous. Oh. What are you gonna do? 
We want people to stay small. See, <laughs> struggle. <laughs> we know. Well, they went ahead and got famous. So we might not see her again for a while, but she sang on our stage. And Jeffrey had listened to her on her website, you know, and, and vetted her musically. But we don't like go through lyrics and censor stuff. We're not, that's not who we are. So she shows up, it's 9.30. I'm sitting over there where I sit when we have guest musicians. And she starts to sing. And of course, I had to give a talk right after she sings. And she starts singing about a suicide bomber. Wow. And I'm like, really? <laughs> pretty, pretty voice. Nice guitar work. A suicide bomber? Where is she going with this? Where am I going to have to go with this? So it's all about me. Yeah. <laughs> my comfort, my convenience. <laughs> she says that guy God loves that guy this is in her song God loves that guy I want to love like that me she says I write people off like the last check on a student loan <laughs> but I want to love like that then in the song lyrically she had two more catastrophic situations. God loves that girl. God loves that guy. God loves these people. I want to love like that. I want to love like that. We lost our minds over the song. I can tell you who it is later. This is a recording yourself. The point of the thing is, she was talking about absolute unconditional love. I want to love like that. Can I? I can do better than I am. I can get closer to that. Maybe I can't embrace the whole world and all of its flaws and all of its faults as I judge them to be with an absolutely open heart, but I can certainly do better. I can certainly go a step further than I have. And that's the thing to realize. When you're trying to figure out how to love in a human way, start with how God loves you and work down from there. First of all, recognize that every person you encounter is a godly. Whether you know them, understand them, like them, all of that's irrelevant. They are a godly. If they're a threat to you, they're a godly. If they're a gift to you, they're a godly. Notice that first. And what will start to happen is you'll see that in people. You'll see it before you see your own judgments. You'll be like, oh, it's a godling. And then, and then maybe some judgments will come up and you'll realize, now why am I having to add that on there? Why am I having to qualify this and stuff? And then the judgments will start to fade away altogether and all you'll have around you are godlings. Can you imagine that? You know what that's called? That's called heaven. That's called heaven. Where everybody's on equal on the same plane and it's just a joy to have them in your life and everybody's different, and everybody's got a different story to tell, a different song to sing, and it all works and it all fits. That's a beautiful way to be. So that's what I recommend and that's what I'm working on in my own life and have been for a while, is to love as God loves because then it makes human relationships easy. See, we don't have to figure out, like, is this person going to like me? Because I'm already liked. Is this person going to give me what I want? Because I'm already getting what I want. I have a source that's limitless. And all I have to do is ask that source. All I have to do is ask in faith believing of that source to give me what I need and will. Why? It wants me to have it. See, there's a real practical dimension to all of this. It's a little clinical, so bear with me. Because when we talk about love, it's hearts and flowers and poetry and music and stuff. But there's also a real clinical side to it, which is this. Love works better than anything else. It greases the gears of life. It's what makes the planets turn and the stars and their different orbits and all the rest of this. It makes everything work. It makes everything work better. Therefore, because the universe is built to work, it's rolling out love through us as an effective mechanism for the fulfillment of its own vision of itself. It's rolling out love through us. It, it, 
When we love, we're in the flow, if you will, of the evolutionary thrust of the universe. And whenever we judge or kind of back up love, we're sort of reversing the flow, except the flow won't be reversed. So you know what it does? It knocks us down. Not with malice, but with force. <laughs> it, knocks, it knocks us down. And we pick ourselves up. And if we're, if we're not ready to learn the lesson, we shake our fist. We say, it's an unfair universe. Because all I was doing was judging and hating a little, and look what happened. <laughs> and when we're ready to give up that racket, then we realize, oh, I knocked myself down. There are certain laws which execute themselves in a certain way. If I interact with them in, in an unhealthy and unworkable way, they'll hurt me. We had a fun time at 9.30 today. We circled up at the end here, and the practitioner of the morning came up, and uh, somebody handed me the microphone to hand her, and all three of us got this massive electrical shock. Oh. Static. So when Lisa knows this well. Lisa's hair looks like that today. <laughs> so, no, just kidding. We, we, we joke about this on Wednesday nights. <laughs> and sometimes just to mess with people, we'll like shuffle our feet a little and then hand them a microphone. I watch, you know. Well, there's a law there. Now, static electricity you can't see coming. But now you're aware of it, aren't you? At least for the morning, because I brought it up. The electricity that's wired run through, runs through these walls. You know how it works. You know how to interact with it. All the different ways. How your car operates. All of this. You know how all of this works. And you know what to do and what not to do. Started learning this from the spirit. Spiritual laws are invisible. It's easy to pretend they're not there. It's easy to pretend there's no law at all. The whole thing's just random chaos, you know. But there is a law and it is there and it is operating. And so we learn to work with it. The law is not constrictive, it's not limiting. It wants you to be happy, it also wants you to have fun, it wants you to have a sense of humor. God may not necessarily care if you're rich, but I think God wants you to have a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Because the whole thing is ironic. The very fact that we're spiritual beings having this human experience, that's like the ultimate irony, and you can do a lot with that on, on the humor level. So the thing's built to work, and all we have to do is participate with it, and that just means we open ourselves more toward love, and you get what you want. You get tools to work with. It won't do the work for you, but it'll give you the tools you need to do the work that you love to do. What do you love to do? We've got some people around here who love to build stuff. They're repairing the banister on the bookstore stairs now, and different tasks and things. And if you said, no, no, you can't do that. Somebody else is going to do that or we're going to bring in people from outside out of the, out of the phone book, you know, to do it. Well, they'd be a little sad because they love to do that. All they want, but they need tools to do it. They need hammers and drills and stuff like this. You give them the tools and they're happy to have it. And you ask them, what can I get you for next holiday? And they'll tell you more tools. <laughs> you know, a new, there's a new gizmo. When they came out with wireless tools, people who use tools lost their minds, you know, because now you could go anywhere and do anything, hang upside down and drill things. And all that else, you know? Like a bat, right? So musicians, no, all the music's already been written. Sorry, don't need any more music in the world. How, how, how terribly sad that would be. But the musicians need instruments besides their own voice, which is of itself an instrument, and so forth. It's all given, it's all provided when we open ourselves to it. So we have a class going on right now called Treatment and Meditation. It's going on on two separate days because of demand, which is awesome. And in that class, we've been discussing how meditation leads into treatment. If you're new with us this morning, and we have some new here, treatment is a term we use for prayer, basically. The idea there being that you treat your own mind, you treat your own consciousness, rather. Prayer doesn't move God around. God's got it under control. God being all there is, it's all there already. So where, where is there an apparent emptiness? In me, so I treat my own mind about it, okay? So how does meditation move into that? form of prayer. And we were yesterday listing the positive effects of meditation. And among them are your metabolism, 
reacts positively and digestive process. Your your blood pressure, your brain waves flatten out. Uh, your sleep is better. How you react to circadian rhythms and seasonal affect and all the rest of this. There's a whole list of these things clinically. Medical schools teach meditation. One of the first was UMass with John Cabot's in. Anyway, it's a very big deal now. And so we made this list and we were all very satisfied with ourselves. And then as the class ended, and I, I was thinking about it and then I went home and I wrote some stuff. Here's something meditation does we may not think of all that often. Meditation softens up the subconscious mind for a relationship with it in treatment. By which I mean this. Imagine that you were to go out on the street and grab at random some stranger and say to that person, let's go into business together. <laughs> They'd look at you and wonder many things. <laughs> And it would all boil down to, oh, no, 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 not, a, not at all. And, and they'd have their hand on their wallet or purse, you know, and it'd be, no, 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 of course not. No, if you want somebody, or much less if you went out and street, grabbed somebody and said, hey, let's have a relationship. You know, they'd be called the cops. Because to have a relationship or to have a collaborative effort like in a business or anything requires a lot of conversation. you got to... You gotta kinda have chemistry, right? You gotta work up to it, and, and so forth and so on. But we go to the subconscious mind, like a stranger. We go to it and we say, now I want a new house. <laughs> now I want a new car. Now I want a new mate. Now I want, here's my list, like this, you know? I mean, even Santa figures out <laughs> if we've been naughty or not. <laughs> Even Santa has some kind of inside info that the subconscious mind, we presume, doesn't. And we go to it and we present it a list of demands. That's not how to work with the subconscious mind. And when people ask, they say, well, I believe this science mind stuff in my head, but I don't have it in my heart. I think there's a practical solution, which is soften up the subconscious mind. Get to know it. Spend some time with it. How do you do that? Meditation. You meditate, you go into the subconscious mind, and you don't ask it for anything. You just marinate in it. There is one life, that life is God, that life is all the life there is. And I need nothing more than to know that. And it needs nothing more for me than to know that. So I go into it and I sit there with that and I sit there with that. And you know what happens as we talked about in classes, very often when you begin to meditate, you weep. You weep. And there's a profound sense of melancholy that comes over you because it's like I'm back with an old friend who I've sadly neglected, though it doesn't think so, but I do. I'm back in my celestial estate, if you will, that I left for the far country with the riotous living, that I left because of my own judgments. And, it, and, and so you weep, and you weep some sad, and you weep some happy, but you weep a little. And what you're doing there is you're feeling something, which is what you're going to need when you treat and put the idea into the subconscious mind that you wish to manifest in your life. Because it doesn't operate off of just cold data. It takes a package of energy with feeling wrapped around it. So if you want the new job or the new house or the new mate or whatever it is, you get excited about the prospect of that before it happens in form. And that's what you hand off to the subconscious mind, which knows no time and no space and it assumes the thing is already done and so it, it produces it as though it were. Because in the land of consciousness, it is done. And now in the land of form, it manifests, and we mark a date, and we say, oh, here's the date the thing appeared. But it's actually always been there. Now we recognize it. So soften up the subconscious mind within yourself by, through meditation, through the spiritual practice of meditation, where you turn within and you know something within yourself. And you find it easier to shake up and affect the subconscious mind of the world the universal subconscious in which we all live with a new and astonishing idea. 
that is grounded in love. And when the idea is grounded in love, it's picked up and run with, it is in sync with the ongoing evolutionary flow of the universe, then everything conspires together for it to happen and things are never the same. Like they were never the same 60 years ago yesterday when four first year students at North Carolina A&T University sat down at a Woolworths drugstore lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina and had the temerity, the absolute gall to order lunch. And folks looked at him, and whoever was serving him looked at him and fed him lunch. And the other people sitting around them, who were of a different color, ate their lunch. And it made the papers. And the next day, Greensboro lunch counter integrated. Four African American college first years, puts them at what, 18, 19 years old? Mm -hmm. Okay, changed everything. And within two weeks, in 13 states, in 55 cities, there were peaceful, nonviolent lunch counter cities. So lunch counters were big in those days. Yeah. Including here in Houston, where a pact was made by the then mayor, who was white, and the then chief of police, who was white, and the publishers of the three daily papers that we had at the time, who were all white, and they all got together and they said they knew in advance. It was on a Friday, I think, and they said on Monday, some people of color are gonna walk into a lunch counter downtown on Main Street. <clears throat> Do not blow this story. Give it room. Let it happen. Let it unfold the way that it is. We want you to know. And everybody who was in the know, who weren't many, stood back and held their breath to see if there was going to be trouble, and there was no trouble. And people looked at each other over their newspapers and their cups of coffee and got on with their life. And all of that happened because it was meant to happen because you can say that the universe is a benevolent system that's set up to work. And things like racism and xenophobia and homophobia and all of the phobias, all of the, all of the hatred and all of the isms and all of this kind of stuff have a self-destruct mechanism built into them. They're going to get knocked down. And I don't mean in a violent way, but by the same hand, if you will, that knocks me down when I judge anything. And it reminds me, all there is is love. All there is is love. And everyone is invited. It's a great big table and everybody's welcome. What a beautiful world it would be. What a beautiful world it's about to be because of love, because of us. If you believe in that kind of thing, that kind of love that unites, brings us all together, makes us one human family, we sing about it all the time here. One human family, one this, one that, we got pictures of the earth and all of this sort of stuff. If you believe in all of that, you may well wind up one day soon, sooner than you know, being one of four first year somethings sitting someplace doing something as a woman, as an LGBTQ person, as, or we don't know what conventions you may shatter, but you will shatter them. Even if it's simply something relatively quiet and under the radar as having a good life when it didn't look like you were set out to do that because of where you came from and how things started out. Never forget when you look back at your family, their family, your roots on earth, never forget that all of us track back to God. That's whose DNA, divine nature appearing. That's for Arthur.
That's the DNA <laughs> runs in all our veins. Divine nature of here. So with that, I give you great love and invite you now to join me in this brief closing wherein we know there is one life. That life is God. That life is all the life there is. That life is my life right now. And when I say my life, I don't mean just me personally. It's the life of all within the sound of my voice. All life everywhere. This life is mighty to heal because there's a very real aspect of it that's never seen anything wrong. That's at that subconscious, subjective, universal level. Nothing's ever been wrong, nor could it be. There are only causes and effects, only circumstances and consequences. I go to that place of pure perfection now to speak my word from that place about each of us here. The love is in our hearts, opens our hearts. Whatever has encrusted around that love now falls away. Old hurts, old resentments, old anxieties, apprehensions that we've piled up, transformed by the light of consciousness, by the light of the one who loves us more than it is possible to imagine. In and through each one of us now is passing that love out through our voices, through our hands, through our feet, through the actions we undertake in this world to be agents of healing in love for all the godlings we encounter. Starting as soon as this afternoon when we stop off at the corner station to gas up the car and our eyes meet with another godling across the gas pumps and without a word being exchanged in our eyes there's a message you're all right you're with friends all is well for this knowing and its manifestation and form everywhere we turn i am so deeply grateful i release this word now into the infinite calling it done and so it is and so it is I will be next door across the courtyard in the garden room next to the bookstore giving affirmative prayer to all who come. And now I'd like to invite you all to close your eyes and step into that circle of love, that pure, unconditional love that's always surrounding us, flowing through us. And feel within you that seed of unconditional love. Feel that seed growing thriving, flourishing, flowing out through you, that pure unconditional love flowing through your life, your actions, your interactions with others. And through this week, feel that love flowing through you. And notice the difference as you flow into unconditional love, and that love you're putting out into your life love you're reacting and acting with other people and relating to. And see that love and how it manifests even greater, how it grows, how it increases. And you know that we will all have <clears throat> this love always there for us as long as we take a minute and remember that place within us, that strong connection to source. And for this knowing and its manifestation on our lives today and every day, I am deeply grateful. And I release these words into the infinite universal law, knowing it good, calling it done, and so it is. And so, so, it so it is. is. Say with me now, something wonderful is happening through me. Something, something wonderful, wonderful is happening through me. I feel it in my body. I feel, I feel it in my body. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in everything I am. I feel it in everything I am. I choose it. I choose it. I trust it. I trust it. I use it. I use it. And I love it. And I love it. And so it is.